Measuring Thin Films and the TPS-2 for Measuring Thin Films. Tradition here in our demonstration corner is we do a quick loop around and show all the instruments that are available here for demonstration as well as one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, so first, before we talk with the MP1, is our GHFM-01. This follows ASTM E1530 for measuring complex materials. Complex materials is described as heterogeneous or uh, layers that are non-repeating. This measures thermal resistance, which uh, auto-calculates thermal conductivity due to the measured thickness. Uh, the temperature range, this is a steady state device. Typical sample size is two inch with a thickness of uh, thin film up to one inch thick. Uh, it is a guarded method, so you get a very high confidence one-dimensional heat travel for measuring thermal resistance. The temperature range of this is subambient up to 300 Celsius, mean temperature. So this is uh, ASTM E1530. This is our other steady state device, which is heat flow meter. This follows ASTM C518 along with the other related ISO standards. This is for measuring heterogeneous uh, insulation and construction materials. There is uh, the thermal conductivity range of this method is 0 0.003 uh, up to 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin. And then there's an extended range thermal conductivity kit that you can plug into it to go up to two and a half watts per meter Kelvin. The sample size for this model is uh, 12 inch square or 300 millimeter square and up to four, four inches thick or 100 millimeters thick. There's another sample uh, configuration size for eight inch square and up to two inch thick or 50 millimeters thick. The standard temperature range for both of those devices, which is the HFM100 and HM50, is plate temperatures of minus, 25, minus 20 to 75 Celsius. We have a new high temperature version of the HFM100, which is minus 30 to 110 Celsius. That's our heat flow meter series. And then coming back to our TPS2, which we'll talk a little bit about for thin films, but this is also a generalized method uh, following ISO 22007-2, uh, the, the year 2022 standard, this has an overall thermal conductivity range of 0 0.1 up to 500 watts per Kelvin. It can be configured with room temperature and temperatures up to 300 Celsius. It is used for measuring bulk thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity, volumetric specific heat, and calculated thermal effusivity. It can be configured with single-sided testing as well as two-sided testing and for measuring anisotropic, slab metals, and thin films, which is what we're gonna actually talk about today. This is our transient hot wire. It's missing its sensor. Uh, the sensor would be in here. This is integrated temperature control. This is for measuring liquids and uh, phase change materials from subambient. Uh, it can be configured to minus, to cryogenic temperatures, minus 160, up to 300 Celsius, depending on your configuration. It is a, a primary method designed for liquids to control convection. That's its principal strength. You can back pressure it to test past boiling points. That's another key feature. This is the baby heat flow meter. We designed this method uh, due to overuse of transient methods for measuring heterogeneous insulation, small sample size. This allows you to test down to sample size of uh, two inches square and two millimeters thick, up to one inch thick or 25 millimeters thick. Uh, it is a, uh, a very simple heat flow meter following C518. And then down the end of the uh, bench is our MP2, the baby brother to the MP1, which is measurement platform. There's a series of primary purpose sensors, so that means designed for use, transient plane source for doing single-sided testing, transient hot wire for liquids, transient line source for soils, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, the MP1, before we jump into thin films, the MP1 is our marquee transient uh, method for measuring uh, thermal physical properties, all related properties. It is a little bit about it before we jump into thin films. It is a, a measurement platform system, so it's built for scalability and future proofing your needs. So it can be configured for just room temperature. This would be the controller if you just want a room temperature configuration. If you wanted the ability to add temperature to your testing, these are our temperature platforms. So this one right now is configured for zero to 300. There's no external cooling. This is a TPS temperature platform, which is transient plane source. This is the temperature platform. So integrated uh, temperature control like the transient hot wire L1 
for measuring liquids and phase changing materials. The, uh, we have available cells that can be used inside of here for testing uh, liquids, pastes, and powders. The, both of these have the ability to go down to cryogenic if it's needed, and a couple other low temperature versions as well. So the overall temperature, depending on configuration, is 300 Celsius down to cryogenic, depending on your configuration. The reason why we're able to add these devices to this are the MP1 controller has a built-in four-channel switch. So one switch, one channel rather, in the front, and three channels in the back. We have smart software that allows you to schedule and take advantage of the controller to control multiple sensors of the same method or multiple different sensors in different methods or multiple temperatures. So traditionally, if you have one controller and one temperature device with only one connection, your instrument is locked into the, the temperature measurement until it's done. By using the MP1 with multi-channel and smart uh, intelligent software, we have the ability to run multiple channels and controlling and getting access to the controller to run other sensors at room temperature or other temperatures to take advantage. So it's essentially like having four controllers side by side, but in one profile and a cost that's significantly less. Uh, the, 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 the transient plane source method in, inside the MP1 has an overall, con overall conductivity range of 0 0.005 up to 2,000 watts per Kelvin. What allows us to do that is having the available test times to accommodate reasonably sized sensors of those high conductivity diffusivity materials. So the MP1 TPS method has the shortest test time of 0.25 seconds all the way up to uh, 2,560 seconds, which is a wide range of test times to accommodate different diffusivities in, in sample size scales. That's really important. Of course, uh, as well, following the ISO, you can do anisotropic, thin slabs, for thin sheets of metal, one-dimensional shapes, elongated shapes for th high conductivity, and, and an arrangement of other dimensioned or shaped size samples. So what we're here to talk about is thin films. So first, I thought we'd talk about the two methods that are common to both the TPS2 in the MP1. So the most commonly sort of thought of thin film method following the ISO, which is 22007-2, is thin film, or what we would call three-dimensional thin film. So that is an approach where we have a specifically designed thin film sensor. So it has a higher amount of nickel to increase sensitivity. That is a two-step process where you're putting the sensor between your selected backing material. In this case, we can do step one in between Pyrex. Pyrex is nice also visually because you can see uh, the setup. We would have this inside of our sample holder, of course. A standard weight. The standard weight is used to normalize the contact between the sensor and the sample. We, would, we could do this with stainless steel as well. The same, same type of backing, just uh, rather different backing, same configuration. Step two. Now what step one does is it gives us a reference value or an estimation of the thermal conductivity between the sensor and the sample, which represents the uh, one layer of Kapton in some of the contact resistance that exist, uh, because contact resistance is the most difficult part of measuring thin films. So step two would be introduce your film. This is for running symmetric configuration. So these are two pieces of Kapton of 25 micron thickness and repeat that process. So you're making a measurement with exact same parameters, exact same amount of pressure, in this case a weight, not a compression stand, and we're importing the data file from the reference file into our bulk measurement, and this gives us an estimation of thermal conductivity of the film. Now where this starts to fall off in terms of its applicability, we know this because we've measured really hundreds of materials with this approach, is materials that have a very rigid surface. So rigid, like Kapton has a very fine surface and very rigid. That has a large amount of contact resistance when you consider the configuration of sensor to sample. So you typically will get an, uh, an underestimation of the intrinsic properties of such materials when you approach them with the traditional thin film by, by the ISO. It does work quite well on materials with a more soft finish. Uh, so when you do that same configuration, this is just copy paper, or sort of materials of a similar nature, uh, you actually get quite good results. So that's something to keep in mind. So that, that method is available both on the TPS2 and the MP1. So that's what we call you know, the, the thin film according to the ISO. 
And that sensor and configuration can be added to both methods as an option. The other method to keep in mind if you're thinking about thin materials is the TPS slab module. And that module is available both on the TPS2 and the MP1 uh, where you sandwich your sensor with, this is a peak, uh, 0.3 millimeters, <coughs> excuse me, of peak. You sandwich your sensor with a configuration of uh, insulation back what we call insulation backing sample and then <coughs> excuse me sensor this is our thin film sensor but it would be the same configuration uh, it would be a smaller diameter we would use but the configuration would be like that that's an, uh, uh, an absolute approach there's no calibration the difference is in the sensitivity of the lower thermal conductivity range between the TPS2 and the MP1 so on the TPS2 <clears throat> the ability to measure slab would be limited to roughly around one watt per meter Kelvin as a conductivity range for measuring such materials. Thickness, again, for the slab method, thickness range is, is a sub-millimeter, so maybe uh, point, approaching 0.1 millimeter. On the MP1, you can get down to 0 0.06 millimeter. Now, <clears throat> on the MP1, the lower thermal conductivity range is around 0.1 watt per meter Kelvin. And the reason why, it has the ability to correct for the backing. So when you're measuring a lower conductivity material by traditional slab, which is what's available on the TPS2, uh, you will have heat leakage into the backing without correction applied. Um, the MP1 allows us to make that correction. That's a proprietary approach we have. By making that leaking correction, we can extend the range down to around 0 0.1 watt per meter Kelvin. So that greatly increases the ability to measure materials like this. Um, so that's a, another consideration when you're looking at thin materials. So the slab and traditional thin film fall in the ISO are available on both the TPS2 and the MP1. So coming back to the MP1 <coughs> specifically, sorry, Excuse me. This is uh, only available on the MP1. This is our transient resistance thin film package. Um, this uses the technology we developed for the MP1, which is for measuring the resistance across two objects. So it works off the principle. These are our standard pieces of two objects, um, stainless steel. Piece A is three millimeters, 21 millimeters diameter. Piece B is stainless steel. Uh, the same diameter, 25 millimeters. So we're measuring through piece A and into piece B, which is a semi-infinite body. Anything we introduce between piece A and piece B, we measure the resistance of. So why is this different? Um, well, when we introduce one layer of Kapton, that gives us a resistance of one layer of Kapton, that configuration. And then we repeat that process with two layers and three layers, and we get a change in resistance with change in thickness. That approach of multi-layer to back out the contact resistance between the layers is quite common. That has been around for a long time. And in fact, the ASTM E1530 has a multi-layer approach for that standard, which measures resistance for backing out the contact resistance between each layer. So what we get is a relationship of change in thickness and change in resistance. The inverse of that slope, so one over that slope, is the thermal conductivity. So you can approach uh, thin films, adhesives, and bonding agents, and tapes in much the same configuration. Now, the key difference is on freestanding films, we want to make sure we do this multi-layer approach to, to remove the effects of um, contact resistance. And the reason why we could do this multi-layer approach here versus uh, the ISO approach to thin films is because we're actually measuring resistance. This is the more appropriate way to do it. And we know precisely the resistance change and the effects of uh, the thickness and resistance change. If you were to test a, an epoxy or an adhesive, so this is the same two pieces, just with a permanent epoxy placed between them, uh, if that added adhesive or tape is acting like a liquid layer, so if, it, if it's highly wettable and it presents good contact, that acts like a liquid layer and is very similar to the bulk properties of the same material. So this is the same epoxy just poured into a mold where we measured its properties on this size scale. Now, if we compare that layer, single layer of submillimeter thickness, I don't remember what it is. It's, it's on the order of uh, 0 0.02 millimeters, I believe. Uh, and then we, we measure this with transient plain source, just standard bulk thermal conductivity. We get pretty, cor pretty good correlating results. If this had a filler in it, 
and that filler was very large in size, and that gives a very high conductivity on a bulk scale, it may not work the same in terms of its applied thickness. So that's some of the sensitivity you can pick up. Uh, if the added tape or adhesive you're adding has poor contact between the two layers, you can approach that sample much the same way as freestanding thin films, where we simply do one, two, and three layers and map out the change in resistance with thickness. Uh, this is our uh, this is our standard sample holder with the retrofit kit for thermal resistance thin film. Standard weight, again, uh, we do a zero on the thickness, so the sample setup would be we would place these pieces inside and then zero with no sample between piece A and piece B, and then repeat that process with one, two, and three layers while measuring the change in thickness and record that data and export it and do the math on the change in resistance and thickness. Uh, by chance, uh, the second uh, capability of transient resistance, uh, if we take it out of this standardized package for thin film, is actually measuring the contact resistance between two objects, whether they be similar or dissimilar, and including the effects of surface variations, as well as temperature and pressure. So that's another module we have within the transient plane source to look at the contact resistance between two objects that may be different or the same and adding in those variables of surface finish, temperature, and pressure. That's a different demonstration, but it follows the same operational principle. So that's our transient resistance thin film package that's available in the MP1, as well as the common uh, slab and bulk 3D thin film that's available on the TPS and the MP1. And that concludes our demonstration. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to do a one-on-one. -on -one. Otherwise, thank you for joining.